All right, everyone is here. I will call to order our regular meeting on Monday, July 12th at 7.02 p.m. We will start with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's a little better than the Zoom version. Looking for a flag. <laughs> it is on mute, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving to our next item on the agenda is correspondence. Commissioner Fogarty, if you would not mind. Oh, my pleasure. From a resident to Officer Crowley, the resident was involved in a case that Officer Crowley was handling. She stated that he was pleasant, professional, and a great representative for SPD. Received from a resident for Patrolman First Class Gualducci. PFC Gualducci had an interaction with the resident. Quote, I am very grateful for the kind person you are. Received from a resident to Officer uh, Patrolman First Class Parade. The resident was pulled over and issued a citation. Throughout the interaction, PFC Gray was very kind and courteous. Good police officers do exist, and PFC Gray is one of them. From a resident for PF Patrolman First Class Newton and Simsbury Police Department, the resident was being harassed while home alone and felt unsafe. PFC Newton was dispatched and made suggestions on how the resident could best protect herself. Extra patrol checks were made, which helped make her feel safe. She was very grateful for the efforts. From a resident for Officer Holt, a resident's son was in a motor vehicle accident. Officer Holt was very patient and was able to calm the upset son. We are so lucky to live in a town with an amazing police department to protect and serve. Received from a resident of Vernon, Animal Control Officer Rudowitz. The resident's daughter was bit in the face by a dog while at a sleepover in Simsbury. ACO Rudowitz investigated the case and was empathetic, thorough, and compassionate. Being a resident of Vernon, I hope my town has such amazing representatives who obviously come to work every day to make a difference and are deeply concerned about the residents in their community. And that's the end of the letters. Thank you. Moving down the agenda, the next item is the approval of the minutes. We'll start with the May 10, 2021. Do I have a motion? I have a motion to approve the minutes of the May 10th meeting. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? No, I think they're pretty accurate. Concur. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes for the regular meeting on May 10th, 2021, say aye. 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 Okay. The next are the May 24th minutes for our special meeting. Do I have a motion on that? Motion to approve the minutes for the May 24th meeting. Do I have a second? I'll second. Uh, any discussion? No. No, they look accurate to me as well. All in favor of approving the minutes for the May 24th special meeting? Um, Aye. 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 Chief, how are the two people at the academy doing? You're well. Yeah. Great news. Yeah. And the last minutes are the June 24th, 2021 special meeting minutes. Do I have a motion on that? Uh, motion to approve the minutes of the June 24th special meeting. And a second. Second. Any discussion? In that case, all in favor? Aye. 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 Moving to the next item on our agenda, public audience. Do we have anybody in the public audience that would like to speak? Okay, please state your name and address. Yes, yeah. Joan Coe. 26 Whitcomb Drive, Simsbury, Connecticut. I am asking the police commissioners to review my comments that were presented to the Board of Selectmen during public audience at the May 24, 2021 Board of Selectmen meeting. On May 12, 2021, I received my FOI request for an internal investigation of a workplace intimidation complaint against Sergeant Sagan regarding the shotgun incident on 4-19-2019. 
It is alleged that Sergeant Sagan walked into the victor, uh, visitor's entrance of the Simsbury Police Department carrying the shotgun in a heightened, anxious demeanor, which was noticed by a member of the staff and reported. It is alleged that Sergeant Sagan walked with the shotgun into the locker room where he was yelling and flailing the gun in the air and making disparaging remarks about the officer's failure of the notification of the shotgun in his daily report. Uh, it is alleged that members of the staff heard the ruckus in the locker room and the noise coming from the locker room. Sergeant Sagan called for the officer to return from the shift change in a loud and demeaning way. When the officer returned to the locker room, he faced Sergeant Sagan holding the shotgun across his chest while agitated as he racked the gun ready to shoot. When the shotgun was racked, there is a loud noise alerting the person that the gun will fire non-lethal rounds when the trigger is pulled. It is alleged that the officer thought his life was in danger all this time, and this scenario, uh, all this time this scenario unfolded. Luckily, there were no rounds in the rifle. At the present time, Sergeant Sagan is a shift sergeant in the Simsbury Police Department. It appears that Sergeant Sagan has a history of bullying and intimidating people and a history of uncontrolled anger management issues that have surfaced over the years. This alleged scenario points to the fact that Sergeant Sagan is a bully trying to intimidate an officer of the Simsbury Police Department. It is noticed in the discipline log of the Simsbury Police Department that on 3-12-2209, Sergeant Sagan was disciplined with a suspension for mistreating an arrestee. On July 15, 2014, the Hartford Current reported that a lawyer sued Simsbury Police Department over an arrest. It is alleged in the lawsuit that Sergeant Sagan, quote, knowingly submitted a false arrest affidavit in 2013, charging Oliver with third degree larceny. The criminal case was nollied according to court <coughs> records. The lawsuit alleges that it would never have uh, even been brought except for uh, animus towards Oliver shown by Sagan. The lawsuit alleges that Sergeant Sagan not only left key facts out of the arrest warrant. Another lawsuit was filed in the United States District Court by Douglas Garofalo versus Detective uh, Sergeant uh, Thomas Sheehan and Detective, Sergeant, uh, uh, Detective Scott Sagan on October 9, 2019. According to the order, the case shall proceed against uh, Detective Sergeant Sheehan and uh, Detective uh, Sagan in their individual capacities on plaintiff's 14th Amendment procedural process claim concerning loss of his vehicle and personal property. On December 9, 2020, Corey Thomas, Simsbury's first black officer, was appointed to the police department with the Chief Balter and Corey Thomas stating that he was a perfect fit. A few weeks after tra of training, Corey Thomas abruptly resigned from the Simsbury Police Department and returned to the New England, uh, New Britain Police Department. It is alleged Sergeant Sagan is the supervisor of Corey Thomas's training, used intimidation and bullying tactics during training, causing Corey Thomas to abruptly resign. Internal investigations in a small department, such as the Missouri Police Department, leaves no protection for an officer willing to tell the truth. There is no incentive to tell the truth or find the truth, as the records show. That same officer would have to return to work and work with the same supervisors in a toxic work environment. It appears from all these allegations that Sergeant Sagan is a liability to the Simsbury Police Department and should be invest, uh, investigated with uh, an outside agency for his unacceptable behavior. These allegations appear to be a violation of the police code of conduct, conduct on becoming an officer and should be reviewed by the police commission. All of my comments will be posted on Zoom's very catch, Twitter at Joan Co. and Facebook. Thank you for listening. Do we have any other members of public comments? Okay, then moving on to the next item of our agenda, old business. Any old business? All right. Uh, that brings us to the report, the chairperson's report. That's me. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to make a 
note on your calendar of September and 11th, that will be September feast. If you all recall at our last meeting, the uh, Spirit Council discussed their events and one of them was September feast. Commissioner Grant has um, come up with a great idea to do fill a cruiser that the police commission and the police department will be working in tandem with. So once I have more information and details, they will be forthcoming, but in the interim, please mark your calendar. Uh, the second item I wanted to let you all know about is that the budget implementer bill uh, passed and it had some information about public meetings and how they're being held in person, hybrid or remote. Um, I'm not gonna get into the minutia, but there are rules and regulations. Should we encounter any of those, we will act accordingly. Um, and that is all I have for my report. So now, the Chiefs. Thank you. Uh, so let's see. <clears throat> Just um, we'll go over some general things. Kind of get, get back on the uh, topic of uh, personnel, and then some new things that have happened, and some updates on some activity in the county. <clears throat> so with personnel, we have two officers who have been on leave for several months due to non-work-related injuries. Uh, thankfully, their health has improved, and they both returned to work. We're glad to have them back. Uh, but unfortunately, two other officers are expected to be on leave for a while. Two different officers. Uh, one was a uh, work-related injury during a uh, police mountain bike school. And the other one was a non-work-related injury. And they're expected to be out for a little bit. Uh, the two newest officers are in the academy and doing well. Um, and later this evening, we'll make a recommendation to the commission to hire a person to fill our, our last uh, sworn officer vacancy. Uh, with the two officers on leave due to the injuries, the two officers in the academy, uh, the one sworn vacancy and another officer who is on modified duty. Uh, the department is again operating at about five or six officers down. Um, so we seem to be fluctuating from that sort of average of three and a half officers to you know, up to five or six officers at a time. Hopefully that number will start to decrease over the next couple of months as we start to uh, get officers back outside of training and possibly uh, hire a new officer to get back or get on the road soon. Chief, what's the strategy to to uh, you know mit mitigate the impact? Do you, um, you know, vary the shifts? Do you? Uh, so we do at times we depending on where those vacancies are, and uh, most of these vacancies happen to be in the patrol division. So we would have to sometimes um, add a body to a shift if we know there's going to be an extended leave. The officers bid every three months per shift. But if we have you know significant vacancies, say two vacancies on one particular shift, we will do some readjustment or we'll do a rebid. Is it overtime used to cover uh, yes. some of these shifts? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Uh, Lieutenant Matt Christian and Sergeant Laurel Harrington were sworn into their new ranks on July 1st and have assumed their new responsibilities. Lieutenant Christian is here with us this evening. Uh, he has oversight of professional standards support and investigations, and Sergeant Harrington supervises training community services, uh, the school resource officer program, um, and has other administrative tasks. So we have the two offices, school resource offices will be next year? Yeah, so as of right now, uh, Todd Christian will be remaining in one position, and the second one at the high school is currently vacant. So we'll move on to the process of the second school. Uh, one dispatcher has been on extended medical leave and we're hoping for a return very soon. Uh, and dispatcher Brennan Halsheed, uh, who you remember from uh, a month or so ago, was hired here as a dispatcher and is doing extremely well in the training program. Uh, he has had, or he has been thrown into, you know, some very busy activities with the storms that we have had and he has demonstrated his um, experience and good skill in uh, in dispatching and communicating and remaining calm and knowing that his resources are so he's done an excellent job. And we expect that he will complete that training program for the end of this month. Uh, for uh, body cameras and dash cameras, the dash cameras were installed in, in the car that we call our, our fleet cameras in May of this year uh, and they've been working since then. Uh, the body cameras rolled out um, at the beginning of this month. And so basically everybody will have, either has been trained or will be trained if they're on leave or if they're at the academy. Um, but you'll see them out there now and this is, this is what they look like right here on, on my chest. 
Um, on to motor vehicle theft updates. Uh, it continues to be prevalent in town, in the region, in the state, and beyond. Uh, we are working to prevent and investigate these thefts. Um, the investigators are tracking down evidence, creating and following leads, and communicating with various other departments. Uh, then the patrol officers are remaining vigilant, uh, highly visible, uh, while the administrators remain maintaining connections with the other administrators from other departments as well as lawmakers. Chief, is your chief's group actively involved in the capital on this all this discussion on juvenile crime? We are, yes. So we, the CPCA, the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, has chiefs that are assigned to their legislative roles and they are they are highly active for that. And then we also have uh, smaller groups like the capital region and we're active in that sense. In fact, we had a uh, a Zoom meeting on Thursday. There were probably um, maybe 10 members of the legislature that were there with about seven of us chiefs. Good. Um, calendar year today, we have had seven motor vehicle thefts from town, all cars that had keys or key fobs. Again, in the cars, one happened to be in a car next to a car uh, for, for that same for that same family had, had two cars here. Um, the window was broken in that car, but they found a key in the next car over to get their car up and running. Um, that is, you know, probably about at the halfway mark where we were last year at this time. So last year we had about 15 at this time. But it's difficult to say that we are on track for less numbers because the year before that, we only had five or six in the first few, first half of the year, and then they skyrocketed. So... You know, we're hoping that this is the beginning of a trend, um, but we're, you know, we're doing as much as we can. Um, we continue to ask the community to lock their vehicles, um, to not leave access to keys and key fobs, whether they're in your car, the car next to it. Um, we also ask that you notify the police of any suspicious activity. We do not want people to engage in those who are attempting to or are committing property crime. Uh, we, we do recommend that you call 911 if you think something is suspicious. You will not be charged with, with, a, with a crime if you think that something is happening and you, you think it's an emergency. If it's not an emergency and we need that line, we will redirect you to a routine line. Uh, we also ask that you do not leave personal belongings in your vehicles. These are all crimes of opportunity, so let's look to prevent that. Um, the routine line, if anybody needs to call for something that has happened in the past, it's 658-3100. Um, otherwise, uh, call 911 and be a good witness. So, Chief, there's no discernible pattern of type of vehicle stolen. It looks more like theft of opportunity, Correct. and then they're being used in follow on for uh, violent crimes. So. Correct. Yep, that is it. Unlike, you know, two, three decades ago where there was commonality between a type of car, a Honda Accord, very common to be stolen. Uh, they were stolen without keys, too. It was just a very different setup in the cars. Uh, in the 80s and the 90s. Now it is, is complete opportunistic uh, move. They are going to neighborhoods, uh, these juveniles and young adults, they are checking for doors. We have videos, other towns have videos of just pulling on handles and moving on until they find the door that is unlocked. They go into that car and looking for some quick things, whether it's credit cards, cash, looking for keys. If the car starts, then they take the car. And then they either abandon the one that they came in, or they use that car, uh, they all get in that car, and then they, they go on to the next thing. Uh, there has been you know, a lot of violence associated with these car thefts uh, all throughout the state, and you know, we have not been, um, uh, we've been subject to that, I should say. Uh, so, again, it's really important to make sure that we don't provide these opportunities to people, and it's very important that. People who call us when they um, see something or hear something suspicious and uh, let us take some action. That's all I have for my report. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about the reports? Yeah, but now I have to find it. Um, are we going to talk at all about the recent um, incident, or I want to say incidents as a group is too? Um, I think it was fire time. Mm -hmm. Um, where there was a shooting or someone that 
Yes, yeah, so the only thing that we're going to talk about here in the public meeting is just that you know we want to make sure people are aware of this. Okay. And, and again, it's being investigated. We put our resources to it. We did from the very beginning when we were notified okay. of this. Um, we are working very closely with other departments. So what happens is we, you know, we, we go, we collect, we look for evidence. We solicit that from people who may have witnessed things, from ring cameras, from all sorts of things. And we try to figure that out. And then you know, these cards end up being recovered. I think 100% of our cars over the last three or four years have mm -hmm. been recovered. Okay. They're not usually recovered in our town. I can't recall of, of one, one maybe, that has, that has actually been recovered in our town. They're usually recovered in other jurisdictions and they're used in other crimes. Mm -hmm. So then we go to try to research, you know, what happened there? Is there any evidence there for us to identify who was responsible for this? Okay. This year, so far to date with the seven vehicles that have been stolen in the town, um, they've been recovered, and we've been able to make three arrests out of those seven, oh. which is a, a fairly high number. That is not a typical, not a typical number for for us or for most places. Okay. I had a quick question uh, on the budget for the general fund for the police department. We're at six hundred percent for our equipment maintenance, like six hundred percent of our budget. Is that right? Am I misreading that? Probably not. I uh, just wondered what so that was. So what page you on? Uh, page one. Page one, the very bottom. The very, very, very bottom. Oh, yes. Yeah. So at the end of this uh, fiscal year, we had some significant um, savings, some money that we did not expend. We were down several people throughout the year. So I put in requests for, for certain Gotcha. Things. Okay. And instead of taking it from where most of the savings was, which was the full-time salary position, um, the finance director just asked for it to be taken from a category that was appropriate. So you'll see in there, um, you know, there's probably four different categories there where they're. Okay, that was just such a. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are we maintaining? Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions uh, for the chief? Are there any uh, numbers that stick out at you as uh, abnormal here? And I guess the one I'd, I'd ask about is miles patrol just down. I'm just curious of why that's the case. Yeah, um, so it, it's probably speculating, you know, on, on why the, the, the miles are down because it could be anything from an increased activity to, you know, we have been looking for officers to do considerably more traffic enforcement. So that means they're going places they're sitting. They're not driving. They're not driving yeah. as, as much. I noticed verbal and written uh, citations are, are up as well. So that, yes. that uh, stands for reason. Yeah, yeah. And we are we are continuing that trend of being highly visible in a, a lot of you know, a lot of car stops to kind of get people back to driving safely again. Yeah. yeah. I think that you know some of the numbers have gone up, um, you know, sort of coming out of COVID. Mm -hmm. Like we've seen an increase in alarms. And people weren't at their businesses, people weren't leaving their homes nearly as much for the last year and a half. So like those numbers are starting to creep back up to where they used to be. But there are no alarming numbers in there. Yeah, okay. I've forgotten what is the category cops stand for? Yeah, it's you a, have to sing the song. Every time <laughs> I see it, I think of that song. It, it was originally designed as a community oriented policing service, maybe. So if uh, if an officer wanted to sign out to get a coffee somewhere or stop in a shop to say hi, you know, they're not investigating anything, but they want to document that they're there to do a meet and greet type thing, then they then they use the cops card. Uh, our community services officer has usually does a lot of those if they put out uh, radar trailer, you know, do various different things. It's just it's just to document some general activity. Well chief what <laughs> Now that we have the deputy chief, you are going to try to do some of that. Have you been successful in that? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Working on it. In fact, we were just discussing some of it earlier today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then moving on to the next item on our agenda, new business, new officer selection recommendation. So I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Chief Christine. Uh, we'd like to introduce you to Kyle Colby, who we're recommending for the position of police officer here in St. Clair. Uh, Kyle grew up in East Hampton, Massachusetts, and graduated from East Hampton High School before enlisting in the, U uh, enlisting in the U.S. Marine Corps. 
He also earned an associate's degree in criminal justice from Eastern Gateway Community College. In 2016, Kyle achieved his goal of becoming a police officer when he was hired by the North Charleston, South Carolina Police Department. Kyle worked as a patrol officer there for th uh, three years and was then assigned to the detective division where he investigated property crimes. He stayed in that position until he resigned in May of 2021 to relocate to Simsbury in order to be closer to family. During the background process, it became very evident that Kyle was highly thought of and respected by both his peers and superiors at North Charleston. Some of the words and phrases used to describe him include square away, top-notch integrity, perfect employee, one of their best detectives who had talent, excellent judgment, and who was hungry to be a great, uh, hungry to be great. Another former supervisor called Kyle a gem and said he wished he could clone uh, Kyle into 10 patrol officers. Other descriptors included uh, having the best of uh, calmest temper and one of the friendliest officers. In July 2019, Kyle was also recognized as Employee of the Month in relation to his investigation of an occupied suspicious motor vehicle, which ultimately led to the suspect confessing to 15 burglaries. Some of Kyle's traits that impressed both myself and Chief, uh, the Chief specifically are his communication skills, his work ethic and history, and his dedication to community service, all of which were evident and consistently demonstrated throughout the various interviews and stages in our hiring process. One incident that helps to illustrate that occurred in June when our agency participated in the Special Olympics torch hunt. The Special Olympics torch run is a three-mile run in which law enforcement members and Special Olympians uh, carry the hope of flame into the opening ceremonies of the local, uh, local competitions as a way to uh, get local law enforcement personnel involved in the Special Olympics community. It should be recognized that even though Kyle was still in the hiring process for our agency, he volunteered to run our leg of the torch run with the Simsbury Police personnel. He has also already expressed an interest in assisting with our youth cadet program. Even though he's not yet been hired, Kyle has immersed himself into the Simsbury community and has demonstrated through his actions that he's heavily invested in both the community and the Simsbury Police Department, that he understands and shares the dedication and core values of community policing that we expect in our police officers. We'd like to introduce you to Kyle Colby. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Um, your resume is very impressive. Um, and I was noticing it's a big shift from a department where you have 25 homicides or more annually to our department and i'm just curious about your view on the shift from such a different type of police department yes ma'am so yeah. it, it is definitely a significant shift um it, it's a, a community i was in in north charleston um it's there it's a, a challenging community as far as crime rate crime rate is concerned um, when my wife and I had discussed coming back up to the Northeast to be closer to our family, um, that kind of carried into a very important conversation for us in our personal lives, um, the type of community we wanted to reside in and become immersed in and, and raise a family in eventually, which is in our near future. Um, so that kind of explains the uh, transition from where we're coming from North or in South Carolina um, to where we're headed up here. Um, we were very much looking for a, uh, a family-oriented smaller area that's um, easy for us to engage in the community a lot more. Um, it, it's definitely a challenging town in North Charleston, um, and, and it's hard to uh, find that uh, more balance in both personal and professional life in that area because of that that challenge and that shift. Uh, but that's certainly something we're, we're looking forward to in our transition up here. Thank you. I'll start down with Mike and we can work our way. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner. Well, have you, uh, it sounds like you sort of committed to uh, law enforcement as your goal uh, yes. in life. Is that, is that correct or am I jumping to conclusions? No, that, that's absolutely correct. Um, I can't say the law enforcement was my childhood dream. Um, my childhood dream was always joining the United States Marine Corps, um, which unfortunately I was able to live out. Um, mm -hmm. I had some challenging times in the Marine Corps. I experienced a medical situation that resulted in my discharge and kind of cut that dream a little bit short, um, which after a little bit of time getting out of the military, uh, transitioned my train of thought into law enforcement. I was still pretty young at the time. I was 19 when I was just discharged from the Marine Corps um, and law enforcement runs in my family a little bit. Um, not significantly, just my grandfather was, was uh, in law enforcement in the Air Force especially, he was an MP in the Air Force. 
Um, so no, I can't say that it was you know something I wanted to do since I was a little kid. But very quickly in my adult life, it became something that stood out to me that um, I felt I was I was kind of designed to do and, and something I certainly wanted to pursue. Excellent. I see you, you've got a, a associate's degree. I do, sir. Do you intend to follow on uh, for a bachelor's degree or for you know, more education in that regard at some point? Absolutely. I, I'm actually the first one in my family to achieve a college degree. Um, so that was something I was very, very proud of accomplishing. And I certainly want to pursue it a little bit further and at least get a bachelor's degree in either criminal justice or a related field. Okay. I, I don't have another question. I'm almost done, but. <laughs> so how'd, how'd you settle on? Uh, how'd you end up settling on Simsbury? So I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and then as, as a follow-on, I, I just want to hear about your Marine Corps experience. Sure. So Simsbury, um, my wife and I, I grew up in Western Massachusetts, which is about an hour from here. Yeah. Uh, my wife grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, all of her family currently resides in New Jersey, and all of my family is still in Western Massachusetts. Um, so I personally didn't want to go back to the hometown uh, that I grew up in, not for any reason other than I just really enjoyed kind of branching out and, and doing my own thing in life versus kind of, you know, just following in my parents' footsteps or, or that kind of thing. Um, but we wanted to be very close to both sides of our family. Um, we're, we, don't, we don't have any kids yet, but we're coming pretty close to that here in the near future. And um, I have a niece and my brother has, has, has a daughter and my brother-in-law just got married. So... Um, we're assuming that they're going to have a family here pretty soon as well. So um, just the intertwinings of our family, we wanted to be close on all sides, basically, a good radius. And we're, we're within a four-hour drive to anybody we want to be now versus 15 and a half. Um, so Simsbury was a great area. We didn't want to go to the big city. That's kind of something we were uh, leaving away from by leaving North Charleston. Um, I wasn't too familiar with Connecticut, but it's a very, um, home, very hometown, uh, family-oriented community, it seems like. And that's certainly something that we were looking for when we decided to relocate right, right up here. And so it was follow, striking distance to your, to the family. It was a, it was a driving uh, Yeah, driving yeah that's kind of a, a, a good point Sorry, where we can have a, a radius yeah. inside of our family here, yeah. but also a very uh, pleasant and nice community to start a family of our own. Yeah, great. Yeah, and then it's I, I, yeah just on the Marine Corps, yeah. I, I'm intrigued on, you know, you said it was a, you know, childhood dream of yours to be a, uh, in the Marine Corps. And, sure. Um, I just want to hear hey, what MOS did you choose and, where, and what, were your, what was your experience? So when I graduated high school, um, I enlisted in the Marines and my MOS that was assigned to me was logistics with a motor transport option. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it to MOS school. I graduated boot camp in Paris Island, South Carolina, and then I did combat training on Camp Geiger just outside of Camp Lejeune. Uh, when I was in combat training, I was about 80% of the way through my training and I received or sustained an infection in my knee. And um, that went pretty crazy for a while. I was in the hospital for about two months. Um, I had approximately eight surgeries on my right leg. Um, and that almost resulted in a leg amputation. So uh, it was quite some extensive rehab after I got out of the hospital from that, uh, which ultimately led to a conversation uh, with my command staff of whether or not I was going to be fit to serve out the rest of my term. Um, I was honorably discharged in June of 2009 um, because that determination was made, unfortunately. I wasn't going to be able to proceed physically because of the injury that I had sustained. Um, so that, unfortunately, led to my exit from the military. Uh, I worked for my father for quite a few years after that while I was in... I, I attribute that job to a lot of my uh, post-military PT, which allowed me to get back to a good uh, physical condition where I can pretty much handle anything I, I wanted to use physically moving forward in life. Um, so that was the result of this, you know, injury, basically, with my discharge. Great. Thank you for you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if I heard correctly, you said he had a particular interest in the young, um, young cadets, right? So talk to me a little bit about that. What's your interest in that? So I, I certainly would love to work with, with people who are showing an interest or displaying an interest in criminal justice. Um, criminal justice and policing, it, it's, it's obviously an important profession. Um, for public safety, public service, whatever it may be. Um, it's a very essential uh, job in any community. And especially in a uh, challenging social climate, um, we have to uh, display what law enforcement really is all about. Um, you know, it's very easy for it to be misrepresented or, or misappeared. And, um, you know, we need to have a good working relationship with not only members of our adult community, but members of our community with our youth and uh, cadets who are looking to go into law enforcement uh, to kind of guide them and show them, you know, that this is what policing is all about. 
and this is how we interact with the community, and this is how we keep that whole community picture strong and together. Okay. And lastly, um, have you had any, well, of course you probably have, that's, that's crazy, but um, can you get, tell us about an, um, an experience that you had where you needed to de-escalate a um, situation between, um, let's say, a couple? Um, like a domestic related yes. situation? Mm -hmm. um, sure, yeah. So um, unfortunately, alcohol it can, can contribute to a lot of domestic related issues, um, drugs as well, but specifically some that kind of jump out to me are alcohol. Um, I've responded to, there's not really a specific incident, but um, I've responded to numerous incidents where um, husband and wife or spouse and spouse, whatever it may be, um, are kind of at odds with whatever the problem is and, and the alcohol or the drugs seem to um, escalate that problem. Um, the first and foremost thing for safety of everybody involved is separation, um, creating distance between um, two people who are having whatever kind of altercation it may be, and then effective communication with each to try to understand each side of it, what's taking place, how to appropriately move forward, and if there's um, you know a, a reasonable res police involvement or if there is not, um, and just effective communication through separation uh, when it's when it's kind of a volatile situation. Well, uh, I certainly appreciate your resume and Thank you. your service in the Marine Corps. Thank you. The person asking all those other Marine questions is a Navy captain, retired. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was a Navy petty officer back when ships were wood and men were steel. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I appreciate your service to your country. I appreciate your service to the town of North Charleston. I think uh, your explanation for coming up here is right is what I was looking for um, Thank you so much. because coming from a busier town, a bigger town, much larger town, much more action as they say, the reasons you gave for coming here are spot on as far as I'm concerned because I, I do have a concern about people leaving bigger departments and coming here and then getting bored. Absolutely. Your explanation about wanting to raise a family here in this environment is spot on and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you have any questions? No. I just know your question. <laughs> well, yeah, somebody's got to ask you. Right? I mean, everything everything looks great. Everything looks good. Uh, is there anything in your background that if you were this commission that you would want to know about you uh, before uh, accepting you as a part of our police force? Is there anything that, that you know, that is doubtful in your own mind or no, something sir. that we should watch out for. No, sir, not at all. Good. Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, we we ask you to leave. <laughs> 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 it's still Sorry. awkward. You can please make it I can't click and be still waiting for <laughs> Which I want to send you off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I say a couple? Absolutely. So uh, we were uh, highly impressed with, with Kyle, with his personality, with his reasons to uh, want to be here, uh, with his reasons to come here to Simsbury. And he took many opportunities to be able to spend time with a bunch of different members of the department. So he spent time with the union president, he spent time with all of us, he spent a significant amount of time with um, the detective investigating his background. And we just all came to the same consensus, that just, a, just a really good person that we want to work with and want to be responsible for the safety of people here. You know, he had applied to another agency as well, in, uh, at Hartford, which is very similar to North Charleston. And once he became, got into our process, spent time here and in, interacting, in, in um, he just withdrew from their process and said, you know, I'm not interested in working anywhere else. This is where I want to be. Um, and uh, I said, and he, uh, I, admit, I, was, I was skeptical when I first, you know, just looked at an application, seeing somebody come up from South Carolina. I was a little bit skeptical about uh, him coming up here. After my first interview with him, I was sold. And, and uh, it, it hasn't changed at all. In fact, um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of it. And 
that it has done uh, and the interactions that we've had have been extremely positive. And so the dedication that we've shown, uh, just trying to get involved in the community and within, in, within the agency itself uh, speaks volumes uh, for him as a person and uh, I think it's all more. I appreciate the uh, contact with the community and the members of the force because it was shocking when I saw it. I was like, oh, 25 homicides for more a year, and that's not us. So that, that shift really um, was a little bit jarring, but I appreciate what you guys have observed, and it sounds like he is wanting to be involved in community policing. So I feel good about that. Anybody else have any thoughts? I'd like to move that we, uh, what do we do, approve the. Uh, department's recommendation to move forward and uh, hire uh, Kyle, what's his last name? Oh, Kobe. Kobe, as a new police officer here in the We'll be looking at effective tomorrow. Tomorrow? Okay. I second that motion. All in favor of accepting it. One point of a last point of discussion. I, I like his experience already. It uh, kind of mm -hmm. expedites his process to get him, uh, you know, operating in the as a full up rounds here for the police uh, sooner than later. So we just go through it, like it's called a comparative certification process. So um, so post C will we'll review his training records, uh, basically put together a, a training program for him. It's usually about two and a half weeks or so. Uh, so instead of I mean to send him to the academy and everything else, uh, he'll just go through this comparative recertification training, which is again about two and a half, three weeks. Long, and then he can go into our FTO program, which for certified officers is typically around six weeks, six, you know, it's somewhat flexible, but in that ballpark, and then he can be uh, on the road by himself. So it'll be a much quicker turnaround time than the two officers that are in the academy now, which we won't see uh, even in a solo group capacity until probably April of next year. So. Any other discussion? Okay, we'll move to the next. <laughs> I keep looking back to you, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, in that case, I will, uh, I lost my train of thought. All those. All, <laughs> all those in favor of accepting the chief's, the department's recommendation to hire Kyle M. Kobe, effective July 13th. Say aye. 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 All right. On behalf of the Sims Bay Police Commission, I would like to say welcome to the Sims Bay Police Department. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming north. <laughs> Get your snow shovel. shovel ready. <laughs> right now we need a park. Uh, where's my jungle? All right. That brings us to the last item on our agenda. Well, I'd like to move at this time that we adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. In that case, all in favor of adjourning our regular police commission meeting on July 12th at 7.45 p.m.? Aye. 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 Next meeting is...